I'm going to talk to you this morning about everything you thought you already knew about orchestration. Um, as was mentioned before, I am the director of engineering at CodeShip. I'm also a Docker captain. Um, there are a couple people from Docker and one other captain, I think, in the audience. Luke, where are you? Raise your hand. Hi. Maybe he's shy. Oh, hey. Um, so if you um, haven't heard of the Docker captains before, we're a group of people that's been working with Docker, speaking about Docker, teaching people about Docker for quite a long time. We've invested a lot of time and energy in the community. Um, oftentimes, captains are maybe someone's first entry point into the Docker community or using the Docker project or the Mobi project. Um, so if you have any questions about Docker, if you're interested in it, you can definitely ask Luke, ask myself. Um, David is here as well from Docker. Um, also, CodeShip. I'm not going to actually talk about CodeShip today. I'm going to talk about orchestration. Um, so we'll go over a couple big topics. This uh, talk is full of live demos, so I hope that the demo gods and goddesses will be kind to me this morning. Um, it's always fun first thing in the morning to maybe um, challenge the Wi-Fi a little bit, so hoping everything is fine. We'll talk about distributed state and the raft consensus algorithm, which is sort of the backbone um, of consensus in particularly Swarm and then other tools like etcd. We'll talk about quorum, leader election, log replication, and kind of the internals of um, how an orchestration system works and manages state. We'll talk a little bit about service scheduling and then finally go over some failure recovery scenarios where I will kind of blow some stuff up and see what happens and see how the systems recover. Um, throughout this, I'm going to talk about some debugging tips, um, have lots of live demos, so hopefully it should be a good time. Um, before we get into kind of the thick of it, I think the important thing to focus our energy on is what kind of problems we're trying to solve with tools like Swarm, Kubernetes, uh, other popular orchestration tools. And I think the long and short of it is that these tools are trying to make a huge cluster of nodes or even a small cluster of nodes behave like one single entity. Um, that presents a couple problems, all of which are solved um, with the various algorithms and tools that are part of an orchestration system. So more or less, um, how does the system maintain state? So if I ask, uh, if I make a request and it gets routed to maybe one node, um, maybe how does the other node know what happened over there and how is state uh, maintained in a distributed system? And then also, how does work get scheduled? So if I ask for um, you know, some Redis instance to be fired up, how does the system know which node has capacity for that and decide where it gets scheduled? Um, I have to make this disclaimer at the very beginning of the talk, um, just so you don't get mad at me later. <laughs> a lot of what I'm doing here, I would not recommend that you do in production, so really take this as educational purposes only. Um, so if, you're, <laughs> if you try to do some of this stuff in production and your app goes down and you can't recover, don't get mad at me. I'm telling you right now, <laughs> please don't do it. Um, all right, so to visualize a little bit uh, more about what we're talking about, this is kind of the makeup of infrastructure um, or the node cluster that we'll talk about. Um, I'm going to use Swarm often as kind of the background for a lot of the examples, but the pattern is true more or less for every orchestration system. Um, I'm going to focus most of the time talking about what's happening in these three blue boxes. Those are the managers. Um, the workers and the managers have a relationship, and the workers, of course, have a relationship. I'm not going to talk about that much, um, that very much today, because really all the heavy lifting is happening um, from the managers. And the first thing that your managers need, um, and, the, and maybe the very first thing that's fundamentally important to understand if you're operating some kind of orchestration tool, is this idea of quorum. Um, and you've probably heard this term kind of tossed around and maybe quite doesn't make sense or it's becoming uh, a little bit more, more firm in your mind what exactly it is and what it means in the context, context of orchestration. Um, so quorum is kind of a general term. It's not a computing specific term. And more or less it means it's the minimum number of votes that your system needs um, from managers in order to perform work. So that work could be scheduling a new task, bringing a new service online, recovering from a failure. If you don't have quorum, so if you don't have kind of the majority of managers online and able to vote in agreeing on an action, that action cannot take place. Um, this becomes particularly important if you're talking about kind of large distribution, uh, or large distributed clusters. So if you have more than one manager, you want to make sure that you pick a manager group that will tolerate failure. That's really what this is about. Um, and we can kind of solve this problem with math, which is really great if you're trying to figure out how big should my cluster be, how big should my manager group be. Um, it follows a pretty easy pattern because quorum is really just n number of managers divided by 2 plus 1. So 50% is not enough. It has to be like 50.0001%. Um, over 50% is what the limitation, the lower uh, limitation for quorum is. 
So again, this is really about fault tolerance. It's not so much about satisfying quorum. So this means if you have a manager group of one, quorum is one, you have zero fault tolerance. If that manager node goes down, your cluster is toast until you can get some manager back online and, and able to vote. Um, what you can notice, though, is a little interesting pattern. Since it's over 50%, these even number of managers are highly inefficient and actually introduce more risk into your system. Um, so a good example of that is if you have a manager group of one, quorum is one, you have fault tolerance of one. If that manager goes down, again, you're toast until you can kind of bring a manager back up. But if you have um, two managers, it's a bit counterintuitive to think that quorum is actually two, because one is not, it's 50%, it's not more than 50%. So you still have a fault tolerance of zero. Um, so please, when you're selecting your, um, the numbers for your management group, use odd numbers. Um, don't use even numbers. One is totally acceptable if you're running a small cluster. Um, three is pretty normal. And if you're running something that makes money, um, I like to say five is a good, a good number if you're <laughs> trying to make money. Um, that way you have a little bit more Tolerance, if you want to do some kind of rolling updates and you, you know that one manager is going to be offline, you can still tolerate another failure during that maintenance period. Um, remember, having two managers actually doubles your chances of losing quorum. Um, bit counterintuitive, but important to remember. Another good tip to keep in mind is if you're talking about um, kind of an orchestration system or manager group that is distributed across multiple regions or multiple availability zones as well. Um, actually maybe wouldn't recommend doing multi-region manager group, but so let's say we're talking about availability zones, make sure that you plan for one of those availability zones to go up in flames. Um, so you want to make sure that you're doing your math so that if one of them kind of blows up, you still maintain quorum. There are some really good recommendations for distribution in the Swarm documentation. Of course, it's kind of valid for every uh, orchestration system because it's not, um, it's not Swarm specific, it's kind of the idea of Quorum. If you're using Docker for AWS, there are auto scaling groups on AWS that kind of will do this for you, but it's also really important that you understand what's going on in case like US East one um, goes up in flames as it often does and then, um, yeah, and then we know what happens, everyone gets a little sad for, for a couple hours. Um, cool, so that's Quorum and that, um, concept of quorum and how quorum is calculated is going to be kind of the backbone for a lot of the other demos. Let's talk about Raft for a bit because Raft is sort of where all of these con concepts come together and, and it's a bit more practical example of what's going on in your orchestration system. Um, I've never ever heard anyone say like I think I'm just going to write my own instead of using Raft because um, it's just no sensible person would ever think that is incredibly complex and they're really difficult to understand. Um, they have a little like uh, kind of three main responsibilities in your orchestration system. So speaking about Raft here, Raft is responsible for log replication, it's responsible for leader election, um, and it's responsible for safety. And I won't talk about safety much today. Basically, the idea is that um, Raft won't let an action take place that's not permitted to take place. Um, it's a little bit less exciting and tantalizing than log replication and leader election, so I'll focus most of the time on those. The other interesting thing about Raft is that it's fairly new. Um, it's not like it wasn't written in the 70s. Um, it's kind of a new algorithm that's designed to be a bit easier to understand. So it's easier to teach, and then as an operator, it's a little bit easier to kind of understand what's going on. And because of that, Raft has become um, pretty ubiquitous, ugh, ubiquitous in the uh, kind of the orchestration landscape. So it's used everywhere, for example, that etcd is used. So if you're using etcd or a service that uses etcd, underneath it, Raft is there doing some of the heavy lifting for managing distributed state. Um, so orchestration systems often use something like etcd. Um, Swarm has it built in to manage their state, and that's often powered by Raft. Um, the main difference is that SwarmKit or Docker Swarm in Swarm mode, Docker in Swarm mode, um, is that Swarm implements the Raft algorithm directly instead of relying on an external service like etcd. So it's kind of baked in to the orchestration implementation in Docker itself. And because of that, um, the manager nodes are kind of doing a lot of work. They're managing state, they're kind of participating in these Raft protocols, and because of that, um, especially for Swarm, and I think it's a good practice for any other orchestration system that you're using, I wouldn't recommend actually running work on your manager nodes. 
Um, I'm going to do that today, again, educational purposes. But if you're running something in production, I would highly recommend not running work on your manager nodes, simply because they can be sensitive to resource starvation because they're doing so much other work trying to maintain the state of the cluster. Um, in the Docker world, and there is kind of the equivalent in every orchestration system, you can do something like a drain on a node to make sure that no task um, or work gets scheduled on that node. The Docker command is a node update, um, dash dash availability drain with the node uh, ID as an argument. So I will, of course, run work on, uh, on these manager nodes for educational purposes. Um, if you're using a kind of small hobby application, trying to figure it out, it's, it's fine. Again, if you're trying to make money on something that's using Swarm, I would recommend um, draining those, those manager nodes. So let's get right into it um, and kind of look into some of the more um, fiddly or fine details of Raft, because I think it's, uh, it's definitely one of my most favorite parts um, of orchestration systems. And let's start with leader election. So we talked about this idea of quorum and how we need a certain number of managers online and voting in order for some action to take place. But what happens when failure happens? Um, and failure will happen. It's inevitable. Um, you can always think, oh, well, my nodes won't go down. Um, but it's, <laughs> it's just simply not true. They will go down. Um, and we need to know kind of how the system recovers. Most of the times, this should be invisible to you. Uh, as an operator, but the times that it's not, you're going to be very thankful that you really understand um, what is going on. And to demo this, I have a terrible domain buying addiction. So I actually own consensus.group, which is my very favorite domain that I've ever purchased before. It only cost me like 15 euro. It was amazing. But I have a demo. Um, if you want to look on your own laptop or device, that's, that's great. I'm also going to just throw it up here um, on the screen so that we can actually look at what is happening in Raft, and what happens when managers go offline, how are new leaders elected, et cetera. Um, so again, this is demo.consensus.group if you want to maybe check it out later. Um, so in this situation, we have five managers online. Um, you can see them all marked with S1, S2, et cetera, et cetera. We're also noting something called the election term. Um, in this case, the election term is one. And we can see, because they're all green and happy, that all five managers are online. Raft works by um, this exchange of heartbeats being sent across. So that's the way that the manager who is the leader can understand that the followers are on online, and that's the way that the followers know that the leader is still online. When that heartbeat drops, then we know, oh, something's wrong, and we have to maybe either elect a new leader, wait for a follower to come online. Um, so in this case, uh, the manager number two uh, or sorry, S2, has come offline. Um, that's not ideal. So what happens, and I'll actually maybe restart this just and slow it down a bit. Um, we can see that these timeouts are timing out. And as soon as that first timeout, S2, times out and doesn't see that, hey, there's a, another manager or a leader online, it's going to ask for votes to become the new leader and to elect itself as the new leader. Um, we saw those little heartbeats and votings uh, go out to the other four, and it came back. And since this is a five-node cluster, quorum is three, we got enough votes, so this new S2 has been elected the new leader. Um, but what happens when this one goes offline? Now these followers don't know kind of what's going on, and we can see a new election term kick off. So in this situation, we have one failure, and that's totally fine because we have five managers. Um, quorum is three, and we still have enough votes. Of course, the leader who's saying, hey, I or the candidate who's saying, hey, I want to be the new leader, will vote for itself. Um, totally allowed to vote for yourself in the situation. So we have four total votes. Um, it's fine. We can see the next cycle of heartbeats. And now I want to go over something that's really, um, I think, just interesting. It's highly unlikely to ever happen in production, but it does show the robustness of Raft and how it handles these very complex um, re-election cycles. What happens in the case of a totally split vote? Um, so in this case, we're starting off a new election cycle um, because we, uh, we uh, passed the timeout and didn't get um, the right responses for this heartbeat interval. Um, <clears throat> and it happened that S1 and S5 timed out at exactly the same time. And when that happens, both of them say, hey, I'll be the new leader. And they vote for themselves. And then they send out a heartbeat asking for more votes. Um, but that happened at precisely the exact same second um, or millisecond. So what, what happens in that case? This is where understanding quorum is particularly important, because if you can imagine 
Um, they're trying to get three votes in order to become the new leader. Um, but in the case of an exact, perfectly split vote, they're not able to obtain the votes. Um, so what RAF does, instead of trying to like reconcile the election, it just throws it out and starts a new one. So I know that was super quick, but you can check it out also on your devices. Um, there's some pauses that start the new um, kind of scenarios. We'll talk about log replication in just a second. I'll, I'll hop back to the slides. Um, so that's kind of leader election. Raft is managing this stuff sort of invisible to you as the end user. There are some really particular cases where it's important to understand quorum, what happens during a new election cycle, et cetera. Um, the other part of, of Raft um, that is crucial for the kind of distributed state management of your cluster is the log. This is a very challenging topic to talk about, especially if you're not familiar with distributed systems. Um, it's a huge source of confusion because as a programmer, you think about a log and you think about something that's like a stack trace in your application and that's not what swarm uh, or orchestration systems um, and raft what they manage. It's something different. It's more of like a ledger. It's an append only time based record of data. Um, so if you can imagine this is the log for some variable n or x. Um, it was first two, and then it became 10, and then it became 35, so on. Um, there's a first entry, there's a last entry, and the entries are just appended. Um, this log is meant for computers. It is definitely not meant for humans to read. Um, there are tools that I'll show you um, that as a human with a computer, you can read them. But in general, this is something that's not really meant for human consumption. It's not the output from your, um, from your application. So this is where the idea of distributed state gets a little bit dicey because, um, as I mentioned before in kind of one of the first examples, what happens when I make a request and then one container, one node performs some action, how do the other nodes know? Um, and the answer is through the logs. So in a simple system, if you have one node, um, things become pretty, they're pretty straightforward. Like you have a request and say, oh yeah, X should get seven. And then the server's like, yeah, cool, X is seven. And then we can just append it to the log and be on our merry way. Um, in a group where there are multiple managers, though, it becomes a little bit more complex because how do we know if X can get seven? Um, what happens if one of the managers maybe has a different value for X that the other ones don't have? And how do they all agree on it? Um, and something can only become truth again when quorum, when your uh, cluster has quorum, and when managers can all vote and say, yep, X can, can get seven, and then yes, X is seven. Um, we can look at a couple scenarios of how Raft specifically manages this um, back at our friendly little Raft demo. Um, this is actually a, a kind of a, an oversimplified example or a simplified enough example um, so there are certainly some details that I'm going to omit just for the sake of simplicity and to making it, for making it a bit easier to understand. Um, so let's say that S1, this very top manager, is my leader, and it has some values that it's trying to replicate out to the rest of the cluster. Um, but as we can see, the, we don't have quorum. We have three managers that are offline, so we can't really do anything. We can't perform work. But what we can happen is, or what can happen is that we can store these values in this sort of uncommitted state. Um, it might be hard to see in the back, but there are little dashed lines around the twos. Um, that's to show that they're not yet committed because we haven't had a, a quorum vote to say, yep, that's totally possible, and we all agree that the new value should be two. Um, so what will happen is that the manager will try and try, but luckily um, for us, maybe we did a little uh, AWS magic or um, changed IP tables rules to enable network traffic again to our, uh, our manager, and suddenly we have quorum again. Now we have three managers online. So the leader will still be doing its work. It's still saying, hey, can we make this two? Can we make this two? And as soon as it gets quorum and that there is a consensus vote to say, yep, the value can be two, um, we can see these lines to go from uncommitted to a committed state. This is, of course, kind of a worst case example when, um, when we have managers offline and the, the cluster is trying to repair itself. But if you are debugging something and something is wrong in your cluster, it's likely to be a situation where you've lost quorum and you're trying to recover from it. Um, there is also some robustness in RAF to repair inconsistencies. So what happens when you maybe have two different election cycles 
or a manager got some uncommitted um, entries and then a new manager was elected who has a different value for those, uh, for those entries that were not yet committed. Um, and Raft handles this pretty well. Um, we can see that we have some committed entries and the, um, the cluster will try to reconcile its state to match exactly what has been committed so far that had that quorum vote. Um, but in this case, we have two uncommitted entries, and then we have a new election cycle, we have a new value. And we can see that um, as soon as that S1, who is no longer the leader, got some notification that there was a committed entry, it just took precedence over the one because it has a new election uh, term attached to it. And because of the sequencer, um, we can say, okay, well that's invalid because that election cycle is passed. This has a newer election cycle, yet let's use that value instead. Cool, I think distributed logging, uh, or sorry, distributed computing logging is super essential to understand. Um, and if this is maybe your first introduction and you're dipping your toe into the water of running orchestration systems, trying to understand uh, distributed logs, there's a really great blog post um, by one of the engineers at LinkedIn, or at least who was at LinkedIn. And they have a handy little bit.ly for that logging post, but it gives you like a very comprehensive um, introduction, lots of very practical examples about what a distributed log is, how they work, why they're important, what other um, services and design patterns kind of use the same distributed log in order to maintain state. I would highly recommend checking that out. So let's look at some stuff um, in the terminal right now and actually run some things. So um, I want to just emphasize that the manager is the one kind of doing the work and it's sending that info out to the followers and able to, to enable it to kind of maintain state. Um, there's a couple things you can do to like prove that that's the case. Um, Cause of course reading the docs is one thing but it's always nice when you can just actually see it happening. Like I said, this, is, this log is really not for human consumption but we're humans with computers so we can kind of do, do some things. Um, one thing that I can show you right now is simply just proof that the log is being replicated um, I'll show you that demo in just a second. You can also read them directly. There's a, a raft tool that will actually unpack the log if you're using Swarm. Um, I won't demo it today because it's a little bit, um, it's just like a lot of text on a screen, but it is in Swarm Kit. There is the CMD folder that has this thing called raft tool. Um, so check that out if you're interested. I want to, um, to enable these demos, I want to uh, show you all something called Play With Docker, which I'm hoping that a lot of you have heard of already. Um, it's a project by two other Docker captains that actually was uh, kind of came to fruition at uh, LinuxCon US, or sorry, LinuxCon EU last year in Berlin. We were like in a bar drinking beers and this is what happened. So um, that's <laughs> always a good recipe. But what it does is it lets you just kind of um, use Docker in the browser. And what I have set up is just a three node cluster of all managers. Um, I'm gonna go on to a different node, and I'm gonna set up just a really simple watch via I notify wait to watch the um, to watch the raft logs. So again, I'm using Swarm. Swarm implements raft directly, which also means that all the files and all the good stuff are implemented directly. Um, I think it's a, maybe a little bit hard to see the terminal. Um, from the back, that's maybe the one flaw of, of play with Docker. So what I'm doing is just running, uh, I have a Docker file that runs I notify wait for me. I'm, I'm mounting in where the swarm files are. They're usually in lib docker swarm. Play with Docker is a bit of an exception, so I'm using a different volume mount, but you don't have to be concerned with it. Um, lib docker swarm, you can like poke around in there and actually see the state of your swarm cluster. So um, for those of you that can't see, it just says, yep, I'm setting up watches um, and we can do some work, I think, on a different node. And then if it's true that everything is working, then we can see some stuff happening on node three. Um, and what I'm gonna do is just set up a very simple application. Um, it's actually one of the Docker examples that's used often at DockerCon and other conferences called the example voting app. I'm in a... Um, I just cloned it from GitHub. It's at Docker Samples example voting app. And it has a couple files. It has some Docker Compose files and also a Docker stack file, which lets me deploy it um, via the Docker stack deploy command. So that's what I'm gonna do. Actually, I've done this already. So I'm gonna say Docker stack deploy. 
I'm going to deploy my services um, using my Docker stack YAML file, and I'm going to name the stack vote. So we can see some networking network starts, um, services are starting. I can see all of um, stuff here. I have some ports exposed. I can see cats versus dogs. Dogs are way better, so I'm going to vote for dogs. Um, and as luck should have it, um, I'm watching the swarm log on a different node, and I can actually see all of the events that this log is being kind of distributed and replicated to the other node. Um, so we have some proof that it's working. We also can um, change our vote. The application is working fine, and I've set up a handy visualizer um, that we'll use in just a little bit when I start to kind of blow away some of these nodes. Um, so we have three node cluster. We can see the worker, the um, vote worker, vote, vote. We have two instances of it. We have Redis. We have a visualizer, the result. All of these services are running in Docker. Um, we can visualize it here. and um, this will help us a little bit when I start to do some kind of blowing up and, and labeling and other things. So let's jump back to the slides and talk a bit about scheduling. Um, scheduling in orchestration systems is a little bit challenging to reason about because, so I studied CS and a lot of the CS like classes that talk about scheduling algorithms, which um, I assume is pretty common regardless of where you, where you study CS, is um, they're kind of like, hey, how can we pack all of these boxes into a bigger box? They're kind of like Amazon warehouse problems where you're trying to um, just do things more efficiently or do things with the lowest risk. The interesting thing about highly available applications is that, is that the scheduling problem set is just a little bit different. Um, we want to reduce the risk of failure of a particular service, which often means um, Traditional scheduling algorithms like bin pack doesn't, they don't really work super well because if you're doing bin pack and one of your nodes goes down, you pretty much blow away everything and that's really not the ideal situation. Um, so there are some overlap or there is some overlap between these two problem sets, but it's important to recognize that orchestrator um, scheduling algorithms are a little bit different than the ones that you're maybe more familiar with if you've studied or, uh, scheduling algorithms before. Two things that are really helpful if you, you are setting up an application and want to use um, some different um, techniques to kind of manage the way that the work is scheduled. So you can restrict word, uh, work to specific nodes, like um, architectures, security levels, types of nodes, maybe front-end nodes. Um, you can also run like Windows and Linux next to each other in Swarm. You can use a label to have uh, to kind of designate, hey, this is a web node, or hey, this is a node um, that can take uh, some security, like more sensitive secure data. You can set this up with dash dash constraint um, in the Docker world. So again, I'm using Swarm as the backdrop for a lot of these examples, but the patterns apply for multiple orchestration systems. Um, you can say constraint, make sure that the label is web, and then make sure my app goes on that. Constraint is a hard constraint. If your constraint cannot be satisfied, that job or that service will be um, marked in a kind of a pending state until that constraint can be satisfied. Um, so that's like, if you can't do this, do nothing. It's, it's sort of the hardest thing that you can tell Swarm to do. One of my very favorite, favorite features is this idea of placement preferences. So whereas constraint is sort of like the hardest, most absolute rule, placement preference is sort of a soft preference, but you're saying like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if you could do that for me? Um, what placement pref uh, will do is it will implement a spread strategy over nodes that belong to a certain category. Um, Again, unlike constraint, this is a soft preference. And what I mean by spread is it's a different type of scheduling algorithm. So I talked about bin pack, which is you're trying to take like all the little boxes in an Amazon warehouse and like find the right box um, that's the right size and fit as much stuff in there as possible. So trying to run as much work on a node as you possibly can. Spread is saying, hey, given the amount of nodes that I have and the, and the um, resources that I have available, try to spread everything out as evenly as you can. So it's a little kind of the opposite way. Um, and by belonging to a certain category, I mean for any node that has a label, DC, any value, kind of find the values of that and then spread them out. Um, I think this is a little bit hard to talk about in words, so I'm going to show you what this means. Um, and I'll also show you how to, um, how to add some labels. I hate typing, so I typed this out um, this morning. Um, so let's say we have node 1. Um, and I want to say that this is in data center A, 
So maybe this is a, an availability zone. Um, and then let's say I have node two, which is in Z. I'm gonna add these labels to them and we can see them in the visualizer that now these two nodes have labels. Um, I won't care really about node three because I'm gonna, I'm gonna take it offline pretty soon. So A and Z are the two data centers that I have. Um, and what I can do now is let's update some service, let's update vote vote and increase the number of replicas. But before I do that, I wanna add a placement preference. Um, and again, this is just a preference, it's not a constraint, it's something that's soft and kind of, hey, can you please satisfy this? Um, so what I'll do is um, I'm gonna use the docker service update command. Um, oops, sorry. I'm gonna say docker service update dash dash placement pref add, which is the way to kind of do an update to add a placement preference. I could also do it on creation. Um, and I'm gonna say that the type of placement preference that I want is something that spreads out the work across all nodes that have a label of DC. And since we just created two labels, we have DC equals A on node one and DC equals Z on node two, we can spread the work across those. Um, so I just updated that placement preference, but I haven't done anything to scale up yet, so um, nothing too remarkable is happening. I can say docker service scale um, and let's vote vote is the one, and let's just scale it to 10. So let's see what happened here. So we should have, um, and actually this didn't work very elegantly. Again, it's a soft preference, so sometimes this happens, but um, we can see that it sort of spread the work across all the nodes. Unfortunately, I was expecting a little bit more like profound impact on nodes that had that DC label. Um, but again, it's a soft preference and it's likely that my nodes were just a little bit overloaded, in which case Docker falls back to do the most, um, to do the right thing to make the, the nodes stay online. Um, or to, sorry, make the containers stay online. So sorry, that was a less than dazzling demo. Um, but you can still see how each of the labels was applied um, and you understand how to add a placement preference and kind of understand how to use them. Cool. One thing um, to note is that Swarm will not rebalance healthy tasks when a new node comes online. So if I were to add a new manager node, none of those tasks are gonna go to another node. Um, there's no reason to take down healthy containers it just doesn't make sense. Um, if the container dies, it will certainly reschedule it on a node that has the most free resources, but um, it's not gonna do that automatically. If you are having trouble understanding your, um, your management group, you can add a new manager, add a drain to it, and then run that manager in debug mode in order to gain a little bit more insight into the inner workings of your swarm. This does mess with your quorum computation, but I'm guessing that if you have to do this, you're probably in like a little bit of a, of a sticky situation where raising your chances of, of losing quorum is, is probably not the, the most of your concerns. Um, so this is one of my favorite debugging tips if you're trying to see what's going on in Swarm. Um, last thing, I wanna go over some failure recovery scenarios. Um, one thing is losing quorum, and I think this is absolutely the most um, common failure scenario that you'll experience as an operator um, using some orchestration tool. So of course, like, I don't mean to sound like, uh, duh, like <laughs> what you wanna do is try to regain quorum and like maybe you can bring your nodes back online. It's probably not an option. I'm guessing that by the time you're trying to debug losing quorum, you've probably already lost that. But I think it's important that when you say, oh, I've lost quorum, my swarm's not operating as expected. The first thing that you should check is if you've lost quorum. Um, because again, losing quorum, it won't take down or make your app unavailable, it's just gonna prevent new work from happening because the managers can't vote and come to consensus that a new action is able to be performed. Um, you need to really figure out what does that mean for your app. If it's a web application, maybe, maybe that's fine. Maybe the risk isn't so great. But if you're like trying to scale up and scale down all the time and new, um, new tasks have to be scheduled in order to process work, that's probably gonna be a huge problem. Um, that, maybe that means that you want a management group with a little bit more fault tolerance. 
So yeah, derp, bring the nodes back online if you can. That's probably the first thing to try. Um, if that can't happen on a healthy manager, you can run um, Docker Swarm init for new cluster, which will say, OK, this is a new cluster of one manager. You have quorum because that manager is healthy, and will sort of start to rehabilitate your, um, your application. You will need to promote new managers to meet the requirement um, of the number of managers that you had before. But it's definitely better than trying to like scrap everything and bring it back up. Um, I want to show you just quickly what happens when quorum is lost. Um, and to do that, I have three managers. Quorum um, is two. So I'm going to knock out two just to leave one manager online. Um, and we can see that my app isn't going to go down. But if I try to do anything, it's not going to work. Um, and I need to regain quorum. So the first thing I'll do is I'm just going to delete some nodes. Ooh, it's always a little bit frightening when I do that. Um, this will take, I think, just a little bit to be reflected in the UI. Um, but what we'll see is that node two I left online. So we're going to have a leader election. Norm node one was the leader of that last um, election term. I Node two now needs to kind of get its stuff together. Um, I may have done that too quickly to prevent actually that um, election from even happening. Oh, no. Here, let's add, um, let's do our handy docker swarm init dash dash force new cluster. What I'm saying here is like, hey, Docker, just totally forget about everything you were doing before. Let's make a new cluster, and let's make it just with this. Um, I'm going to advertise adder as, OK, cool. So now I have successfully created a new manager in a new cluster. Um, and what we should see, hopefully, in a second for my last trick is, yes, that some of these are starting to come back online. Um, so I totally blew away nodes. I recovered by saying force new cluster. And then um, I lost my visualizer, but we should still be able to see this um, online. Sorry, wrong one. OK, that's not working perfectly, but it's fine. You get the point. Um, we can see in the text output that we have new services coming online. One last note is that because we do have all of the data um, and all of the log files inside of that lib, uh, that Docker Swarm directory directly on the manager nodes, if your data center happens to like catch on fire or some zombie apocalypse, apocalypse happens, as long as you have a backup, you are able to restore from that backup. It's not going to be perfect and wonderful and pristine, um, but it is possible. The steps are pretty straightforward. Um, you have to stop Docker before you do a backup. You can RMRF that varlib docker swarm directory, copy your backup into that directory, and then start Docker back again. You're basically repopulating the logs. Um, and then when you start Docker and do a Docker swarm init with that force new cluster, everything will sort of come back to life in the last state that was um, saved in your backup. There is kind of some wonkiness when it comes to IP addresses. Um, Long story short is that if you have to, if you're planning on having to use this technique, make sure that you have floating IP addresses allocated to your managers that can be reassigned. Um, Docker gets a little bit um, unhappy if you're trying to restore from a backup and your machine has a different IP address than the one that the backup has. If you use floating IP addresses, you can kind of solve that problem for yourself. Um, if you're interested in administering Swarm or you want to know more about um, lots of very um, kind of disaster recovery scenarios, uh, there is a really good administrator's guide or admin guide for, for Docker Swarm on the Docker website, um, on their docs site. I often have to reference that even as someone who's been using Docker for um, since like well pre 1.0. So please check that out. Um, thank you for being a wonderful audience on this very sleepy, uh, rainy morning. 